This was put together by Jillian Johnson, who is our West Coast sales manager. And I have given this presentation to some of you before. And uh, so this might be a review, but um, hopefully it's not. And we'll take some questions at the end. So when we think about mouthfield madness, um, we really need to think about today's wine consumer and what's going on out there in the marketplace. Some of the statistics show us that within the first 24 hours of, of a purchase, that wine is consumed. So you think about Jane Doe, John Doe going to the grocery store essentially with their grocery list. And you know, they're buying their chicken, their fish, their meat, their veg uh, for that evening's meal. And they're picking up a bottle or two of wine to go along with that. Or they're picking up a bottle of wine because they're going over to their friend's house essentially. So what is that consumer looking for? They're looking for wine that they can open up uh, that night or within the next two nights, essentially. And they're looking for something kind of easy to drink that goes along with their meal or goes along with their meal prep. So what does that mean for today's winemaker? So that's you and I. And so we're challenged with trying to make wines that are ready to drink in a shorter period of time. So kind of foregoing what we kind of think in the romantic world of 24 to 36 months of aging in barrel or on oak, essentially. And then we also have to think about bottle shock in the sense that, you know, wines aren't going to be stored in the warehouse for six, eight months while they under, undergo bottle shock. Those wines are going to sit in that warehouse for about four to six weeks because your sales team has done a bunch of sales projections and that's what's driving that bottling line, essentially. So wines are bottled to order, they sit in the warehouse and then they're shipped out to that grocery store, essentially. Well, mouthfeel is kind of complicated. And we have here a picture of the palpe of the tongue and we're looking at all the different regions, you know, that we have pick up that textile sensation, essentially. We have uh, on the top of the tongue, we have on the sides of the tongue, we have on the back of the tongue. These are all areas and regions of our palate, essentially, that we're really trying to hit, uh, essentially, on that wine consumer. Everybody is created a little bit differently, so we all have a little bit different palates essentially and that's an example here we all have different number of taste buds and taste buds in those different regions essentially so when we think about mouthfeel it's kind of complicated we have tactile senses uh, the mechanical perception the actual uh you know the actual feeling of the wine going over the tongue essentially and hitting all those sensory regions um, you got to think about saliva production you know did I have too much coffee or tea this morning? Did that consumer have too much coffee or tea this morning? Am I a little bit dehydrated? And we all produce a little bit less or more saliva. And so that all kind of affects that whole mouthfeel kind of sensation. I always tell uh, folks when I'm putting wines together that if I can come up with three words for an aroma, three words for a flavor, and three words for a texture, I've got a pretty good back label. And it's that last part, the three words for a texture, and I think the consumer really doesn't understand quite yet that feeling of wine in our palate. And so that's what we're going to try to continue to talk about today. So how do we evaluate mouth feel, essentially? In order to talk about it, we've got to be able to evaluate it. And so in 2000, UC Davis came up with the mouth feel wheel. This is very analogous to the aroma wheel that probably most of us have used once or more times in our winemaking careers, essentially. And really is what this does is it's creating a vernacular, uh, a common terminology for us to be able to discuss feeling that texture, that mouthfeel texture uh, on a common basis, giving us a language essentially. And so we've got to remember that we have the same kind of tactile senses in our fingers that we do in our tongue. And so we can kind of create some standards essentially by feeling some of these things, some of these chamise, the talc, the satin, the say, the velvet, the furry, we can use tactile sensations of our hand to try to mimic that what would be in our mouth with wine, essentially. So trying to draw that association between tactile touch with our fingers and that same tactile sensation on our palate, essentially. And so we can do this with actual swatches of cloth, essentially. So satin or suede or silk or a burlap sack to mimic that kind of texture you might feel on your mouth. And so Jillian had actually attended that UC Davis seminar 
And this is a picture of what they were doing is they were sitting there tasting the wines and feeling the wines on their palate while feeling these swatches and trying to identify what that wine felt like on their palate and what it felt like as a texture of a material in their hand. And so to evaluate mouthfeel, this is a good practice for those of us to practice as a group. You know, bring in your assistant winemaker, your knowledgeist, your other team winemakers, essentially, get these swatches um, and come up with that common language. Try to evaluate these wines as you put them together uh, before they go in the bottle and write these notes down. Say, uh, come up with that common language and write down what you feel that wine is. We can all smell a wine and be like, oh, that smells a little bit reduced. It's a little bit oniony or cabbagey. But let's kind of talk about that texture. Oh, it feels very satin or silky, or it's a little coarse, like a burlap sack. Um, these are the same sorts of things. It's a new language that we're really kind of developing for that textile sensation on our palate. So now that we've kind of defined mouthfeel uh, and that language, what we really want to do is talk about how to build mouthfeel uh, and when to build mouthfeel in the process, essentially. So we want to start early. We want to start with fermentation tannins. Fermentation tannins, those sacrificial tannins, that BR supra, that helps preserve the natural grape seed and skin tannins in our wines. Also preserves the aromatic profile of our wines. Um, maceration enzymes, okay. So maceration enzymes not only help with clarification, but release color and tannins. Certain maceration enzymes like Lafort HE Grand Cru has a very unique side chain activity, Ramnose 2 Galacturanase. Ramnoses are nothing more than a five carbon sugar attached to a pectin chain, essentially. That Ramnose molecule actually adds roundness and sweetness to a wine. So without that side chain activity, that carbon is essentially lost on the pectin chain into our leaves. Certain yeast strains for both reds and whites will help develop mouthfeel. Uh, some of you might be familiar with FX10, X-Pure, or VL3. These yeast strains from the fort offer HSP12, heat stress or heat shock protein. And this has been identified by Lafort to actually add that kind of voluptuousness to a wine. These yeast strains have a propensity to develop, to, uh, develop that HSP12 peptide and develop that uh, really kind of round mouthfeel. And then we have yeast derived products. So these are yeast extracts essentially that help add volume and, and uh, roundness to a wine. So we also think about building mouthfeel in the aging and finishing stage. So these are kind of products that we're thinking about uh, right about now. It's March and we're looking at wines, red wines probably from the previous vintage. It'll be going into bottle here very soon. And so we're looking at aging and finishing tannins. We're looking at gum arabics, so uh, Stapabin SP. Again, yeast-derived products, barrel and oak alternatives, as well as enzymes for really kind of giving our wines the full structure and volume that we're looking for. So using tannins for building mouthfeel, it's important to note that all the four tannins go through the IDP process, instantly dissolving process. This is like that instant coffee from Starbucks. It's actually a pretty good, decent cup of coffee, and I use it myself sometimes, especially when backpacking. But you don't need to mix Lafort tannins in any sort of solution, any sort of hot water to get them to activate. For fermentation tannins such as BR Super, you can simply sprinkle them on the must. For maceration tannins during fermentation, like VR Color, you can simply sprinkle that on top of the cap or during the pump over. And then for all the finishing tannins as well, you can simply sprinkle those into the wine vat while you are circulating. There's no need to make a solution in the hot water or anything like that. These are instantly dissolving in your wine. So for aging tannins, and right about now, it's March, and so you're probably, if you haven't already, evaluating your structure of your red wines from the 2019 vintage. And you're probably evaluating some of your blends that might be going into bottle come August. And so we have three aging tannins from the fort. We have tannin VR grape, which is exclusively from grape seeds and grape skins. We have tank or Grand Cru, which is a combination of both Elijah tannins from oak and grape tannins. And then we have Tancor, which is primarily oak tannins. I highly recommend if you have 
any wines that have a little lacking of structure, that you do a bench trial using all three of these tannins. It's pretty simple. You set up a bench trial of each of these tannins at 100, 200, and 300 ppm. Allow them to age on the bench for about three weeks and come in to evaluate those wines, essentially. And I often find that sometimes a, a combination of the two actually works very well. Sometimes like a 200 ppm of Tancor and a 200 ppm uh, addition of Tancor Grand Cru tends to be the winner. But this is something you want to age on the bench for about three weeks and then implement into your winemaking process about six weeks ahead of the bottling time for the optimum integration. And then we also offer finishing tannins. The finishing tannins are all 100% oak extracts. And these can help enhance a wine's aromatic profile. They can enhance that mouth feel uh, through a structural addition and as well as adding some sort of sweetness. And finishing tannins also offer you that antioxidant property, protecting your wines during the aging, the racking, and the filtration process because gallic tannins do absorb oxygen. So vegetal tannins can, uh, or excuse me, finishing tannins can mask vegetal aromas. They can also enhance your oak profile. And we're not replacing the oak with these finishing tannins. All we are doing is kind of enhancing that oak characteristic you already have, adding that last three to maybe 5% of uh, your oak extract, adding another layer of complexity in there. For your bulk wines, essentially, we can increase the perception of quality and get you a better price by using finishing tannins to give that impression that there's oak on this wine without having had to age it for a significant amount of time. And then finishing tannins can also reduce the perception of astringency. How they do this is, you know, you have these tannic wines and everybody wants to strip them out with gelatin and kind of soften them up and then maybe rebuild it with some other tannins. But you know, if you have a few potholes in the road, you don't go and tear up the entire road and then relay new asphalt. No, you simply use asphalt to fill in the holes, essentially. And that's what these finishing tans can really do. They act as the filler in those potholes and kind of smooth out that perception of the wine, essentially, and kind of round it out and filling in those holes and, and giving you a better perception. So I always like to build things with tannins versus stripping things. Because when we strip things like with gelatin or veggie call, I find that we tend to strip some aromas as well. So if you're not familiar with the queer tannin line, the queer tannin line going from left to right increases in aromatic intensity, but going from right to left uh, increases in structural intensity, essentially. So on the left-hand side, we have queer tannin, uh, which has the most structural intensity, but has the least aromatic intensity. And then we go to the far right, where we have queratin and intense having the most aromatic impact, but the least structural impact. So queratin, as I said, offers the most structural impact. It's a very light toast. has excellent antioxidant properties. And actually, we've seen in some studies that... Um, during your aging process, if you're in neutral barrels, a simple 10 to 15 ppm addition every six to eight weeks when you're topping your wines actually replaces those gallic tannins that you've lost in your neutral barrels, essentially. It's a great for uh, tannin for actually kind of uh, absorbing some off odors and characteristics, helps kind of enhance some uh, the lighter fruit tones, essentially. Uh, and adds a little bit of that structure to a wine that may just be lacking just a little bit. Queer tannin sweet is analogous to that medium toast, essentially. And again, these are all oak extracts. So this offers kind of a rich vanilla kind of characteristic. It tends to enhance the red fruit characteristic. So I get a lot of raspberries in some of our wines that we use this on. Uh, and then, again, can help kind of mask them off kind of characters offers that kind of sweetness and roundness sensation in our wines. Then we have the Queratin and Chalk. And Queratin and Chalk, being more on the medium plus side, darkens some of those fruit characteristics, more of the blue and, and getting into some of the black no notes uh, in terms of darkness of fruits, tends to highlight some kind of chocolate notes in a wine and offers that sensation of sweetness. And I find Queratin and Chalk to be a very good bridge, actually, in filling in some of those potholes a lot of times in some of our 
you know, more tannic wines or more astringent wines, if we really just kind of want to smooth some things out, I do recommend giving a, a, a shout out to Quare Tannin Chalk for kind of smoothing that out. And then we have Quare Plus. Quare Plus is the only American oak in this lineup of our Quare Tannins. And this is analogous to kind of like a medium plus toast. Quare Plus offers a lot of this kind of maple kind of characteristic. Actually works very well in Zinfandel, brings out some kind of the red fruit kind of characteristics, offers a lot of sweetness and kind of helps lengthen that mid palate essentially. And then we have Quare Tannin Intense. So now we've moved all the way to the right hand side to the extreme in terms of high aromatic intensity, but low on the structural intensity essentially. This gives a nice uh, sensation of kind of coffee and nuts. Um, works very well in Chardonnays, actually. So uh, giving that kind of like heavy toasted head with the medium barrel body essentially sensation. I've actually used this in rosés at about five ppm just to add a little bit of that nutty complexity essentially. Um, so most of the queer tannins I do recommend starting at about 20 ppm. You might go 20, 40, 60, 80, up to 100 ppm, and on some extremes, 120 ppm. With queer tannin intense, though, I do recommend starting around 5 or 10 ppm. You might only go up to about 20 ppm because, again, it does have the highest amount of aromatic intensity. So we want to think about building our structure in our wines first for our mouthfeel. And so that's with those fermentation tannins, the aging tannins, and those finishing tannins. So let's do that first. Let's build those structure. And then we can talk about building in volume, something to kind of really carry the fruit flavors and round out that wine and make it just like this big thing in your mouth, essentially. And so we'll take a look at these volume producers and what these products are, essentially. So auto lease. Autolese, we've talked about a little bit about that HSP-12 peptide that we found in FX10, Xpure, and VL3. A lot of products out there on the market, they talk about uh, polysaccharides, peptides, and manoproteins. What separates Laporte from a lot of those other product companies that we've done the research and we've identified a very specific molecular weight peptide or very specific molecular weight manoprotein that actually adds that roundness and sucrosity. to something. So Lefort has a patent on the extraction process for that heat shock protein, HSP12. We grow yeast in an environment that enriches them to build up that HSP12, and then we extract that. The really cool thing about Annalise is you can dial that in at you know, 20, 40, 60 ppm. I find that Annalise really works well on the entry uh, of a wine and adds that front entry kind of roundness and broadness and lets that wine kind of leave clean. So if you like your white wines that kind of come in big and fill your mouth with fruit flavors and then leave with some nice bright acidity, Autolise is a great product for that. I also find Autolise to kind of help lift aromatic uh, aromas a lot of times. Manofeel, again, a very specific molecular weight manoprotein extracted from yeast cell membranes, essentially. This is a really that gumball in your mouth kind of sweetness sensation. Really helps kind of let that wine come in. It explodes in your mouth, giving you this huge gumball kind of feeling, and then allows the wine to leave clean. It also allows that kind of flavor to linger in there. So that big, juicy, rich Syrah or Malbec, it really kind of helps give it that full body richness and lets that flavor linger. And this is something you would add just after your pad or cross flow filtration before um, your uh, bottling. And then we have gum Arabic, so Stabovin SP. Stabovin SP has the lowest clogging index of any other gum Arabic out there on the market, which makes your seller very happy. And I find as a winemaker, a happy seller makes a happy winemaker, essentially. HSP, uh, the stab of an SP, uh, we've talked about the auto leaves being the front, the mantle field being the middle, and stab of an SP really works very well on the back palate, I find. Helps kind of surround a lot of those kind of uh, tannins, essentially, that might be kind of perceived as harsh or astringent, essentially. Uh, and again, the lowest clogging index of any gum Arabic out there. And then enzymes. 
uh, some of us don't think about enzymes in the aging process or in that mouthfeel sensation process. But if we're aging any of our wines, Sir Lee, doing that botanage, what extralyse does for you, it speeds up that process. Enzymes catalyze reactions, they speed up reactions. And so all we're doing is helping those speed up that process of breaking your natural lees down, releasing those peptides and those mannoproteins into your wine, adding that richness and that mouthfeel, essentially. Extra lice, uh, having beta-glucanase activity in it, actually will help break down the glucan. So if you've ever had any botrytis on your fruit, if you have um, any of that going on, that'll clog your filters. Extra lice will help break those glucans down. If you didn't add enzymes up front in your juice stage during your maceration stage, Extralyse is a great product for breaking down those pectins. Again, that can clog your filters, essentially. And it's time and dose dependent. So anywhere between 60 and 100 ppm and anywhere between 6 and 10 weeks of contact time. You will want to stir your wines either in tank or in barrel once a week to at least every two weeks while you're using this product. And so then we want to talk about the timing of bench trials, essentially. So we've talked about some of the tools that we can use in our uh, toolbox, essentially, those fermentation tans, the macerating enzymes. We've talked about some of those aging enzymes. We've talked about some of these finishing products, essentially the auto leaves, the manofeel, and the HSP12. And so how does this kind of all fit together in the picture? So here it is, March 2016, right? Sometimes I do wish I could go back to that year. Um, but it's right about now that if you're looking at bottling by the end of the month, hopefully at this point in time, you've got your bench blend together. Uh, maybe it's already put together in your cellar and you're tasting it, uh, essentially, and you're kind of looking at where some of the holes are and whatnot. If you've got a perfect blend, great. I would still encourage you to do um, some bench trials with some of the mouthfeel and tannin products, essentially, because if doesn't take much more than 30 minutes to really kind of bang out some of these tannin trials, essentially. And you can kind of see where you might be able to enhance a wine. So this week, you're essentially kind of evaluating your blend. You're doing your bench trials this week. Next week, you get the products ordered, you know, allowing 24 to 48 hours for that one, that shipment of product to be received into your cellar. And then you have to write the work orders, essentially. So then you're by the third week, you are making these additions, essentially. You're adding your tannins or you're adding your autolies and your mantle so that by the next week, you can basically um, get these wines into the bottle. And a mouthfeel kit, essentially. This is what every Lafort rep carries around with them. And it's something that really every winemaker should have in their laboratory or even in their winemaking office. It's a great little toolkit. What, what is in that toolkit, essentially, is a 10 to 100 micro pipette. And don't forget the tips for that. You need a 50 mil centrifuge tube or 100 mil beaker with a stir plate so that you can make the solutions essentially. A 50 to 100 graduated cylinder for measuring out the volumes of wine. And then a scale that goes from anywhere from one to five grams. If you can get one that goes down to about a half gram, even better. And then some weigh boats and some weigh paper. And the overall cost of investment is about $350. But this is material that will last you for years essentially. It allows you to do have those tools at your disposal, essentially. So here's a quick uh, example of how you would perform bench trials with, say, some of the quartans. You'd want to make yourself a 5% solution in that graduated uh, 100 mil beaker or in one of those 50 mil centrifuge tubes. You would simply take one gram per 20 mils of uh, DI water. So then I would like to measure out a 50 mil solution of wine. And if I want a 20 ppm dose of a quartan and I simply pipette 20 microliters of that 5% solution. So it's pretty easy math, essentially. That calculation comes out to be X microliters of that 5% solution into a 50 mil wine glass equals X ppm in your tank, essentially. There's no kind of figuring out if uh, you know I did 20 microliters into 100 mils and then I got to double my number to get to that tank. Uh, whatever the volume that you pipetted in, uh, of that 5% solution into a 50 mil wine glass is the same exact PPM that you're going to dose into your tank. 
Hopefully some of you have these uh, little bench trial calculation cheat sheet cards. These are a great tool and I use them all the time. So if you're going to scale up from that 50 mil glass sample into 100 mils or 250 mil or that 375 mil sample essentially, you simply look at the left hand side where you want your desired PPM and it'll tell you the exact amount of microliters of that 5% solution that you want to put into that flask essentially. If you don't have any of these cards, call your Lafort rep, get those out to you. If you have any challenges or just need to be kind of walked through the initial steps of using some of these tools, um, the Quare Tannins, the Mount Field, the Autoleaf, you call your Lafort rep. We're more than happy to kind of come in and kind of guide you through this process, taste with you, and kind of help develop some of that language in terms of tactile sensation. And that's really kind of the end of, of Mouthfield Madness here in the month of March 2020. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your time. Again, if you have any sort of questions, you can get a hold of us at one of three locations, the main office, the St. Helena store, and the Paso Robles store. During the harvest time, we do have the Windsor store open. If you miss something, please reach out to Caitlin. Her email is down below. And if you'd like to re uh, receive a recording of this video, uh, please go ahead and contact Caitlin and she'll get that out to you. And if you have any questions at this time, I am more than happy to kind of go ahead and answer those. So I had a question come in. Um, any thoughts on improving the mouthfeel and pellet on a wine that has been frost exposed? Uh, yes, so we did have some folks out there, up, especially up in Washington, unfortunately received an early frost. And I know some of the folks down in Texas as well. Uh, for me, I would highly recommend going through uh, using the uh, VR grape tan core and the tan core ground crew products and you know, these wines have been frost uh, damaged they really didn't get that hang time out there to really develop the tannin structure that they would normally by hanging out on the mines a little bit longer so again making up a five percent solution of all three the vr grape the tan core ground crew and the tan core and then simply dosing uh, at 100 200 300 ppm separate bottles of each of those tannins, allow them to hang out on the bench for, I could say about three weeks, essentially. Come back and evaluate those. And then, you know, you can look at blending some of those things, but that would be my first uh, step in that. You can also look at using some of the oak adjuncts from Lafort, and that's in the Nobile brand there. And that uh, some of those oak uh, adjuncts, uh, namely like the base, uh, the extreme, offer a lot of the volume roundness and the sweetness from the oak essentially um, and enolese is actually a very good product um, enolese has that hsp12 peptide in it has the yeast holes that kind of act as a finding agent kind of bringing out some of the off characteristics so you can dose those in at 100 200 300 and 400 ppm allow those to sit on the bench yeah one or two days really to allow the yeast holes to kind of settle out and then evaluate that uh, roundness in there. So that's uh, that would be my suggestion for the frost-tainted wines. Any other questions? All right, everybody, doesn't seem like there's any other questions coming in. 
Again, I'll just remind you all to contact your Lafort rep, have them come in, do some bench trials with you. It's a great experience to kind of get them to just kind of show you what the lineup of some of these products can do for you. And it's really important for you to taste them in your own wines and taste as a team, essentially. And it really helps speed up the process when they can taste the wines and they can make some suggestions in there as well. Uh, and if you have uh, need samples or any other supplies, go ahead and call one of the main offices and uh, they'll take care of you. Happy Friday the 13th, everybody. Uh, Stay safe and uh, sane out there. It's, uh, it's getting a little crazy. So uh, happy the rest of March. Happy bottling. Happy spring. And uh, thank you for attending the Fort uh, March Mountfield Madness Seminar.